Hello there, fight friends. Andy Cotterell here with Surhi City. Surhi is making his UFC debut at UFC 297 in uh, Toronto. I almost said Vancouver, in Toronto on January 20th, which is just two weekends away. Surhi, how are you? I'm great, brother. You know, just excited for the moment, finishing up my uh, my finishing touches of camp. Feeling great, bro. Ready to rock and roll. I bet you are excited. Now, this is always a question I kind of ask when I talk to Contender Series fighters, is that Contender Series is a UFC, right? You, you fight in front of UFC fans, you fight in front of UFC staff, you fight at the UFC Apex. Uh, does it feel like it's a UFC debut to you, the last one, the Contender Series, or does this feel like the real debut to you? Um, yeah, I think the biggest difference would be the crowd aspect. But I definitely feel like when I fought on the Contender Series, man, like I had that same pressure of like I'm on national television, you know. Um, international. I'm at, international, sorry. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'm in front of Dana White, Sean Shelby, right? I'm at the UFC Apex. So definitely like it feels like I've kind of already done it. The the biggest difference would be the the fans, man. And that's mm. – uh, but I love the fans. So that's something that I'm super excited for. So I, I wasn't going to bring this up, but it just you mentioned it's funny when you're doing an interview, you kind of have to give, have a given flow where we actually listen to your interview and use the words they say. So you just mentioned Sean Shelby. Tell the story about how you got introduced to Sean Shelby and how uh, that all came around and who introduced you. Yeah, funny, funny story. Uh, the first time I actually met Sean Shelby, it was after my, uh, my last title defense at BFL in Vancouver. So it was the day... I fought the day before the UFC Vancouver card. And, uh, mm. you know, we, uh, after uh, Milad and Jasmine and everybody had a great night, we went back to the, their hotel just to go hang out with them, say congratulations and stuff. And uh, I saw Sean Shelby uh, at the hotel bar, just like at the lobby bar there, you know, and he's, he's having a few drinks with, with uh, Paul Felder and then somebody else out there. I forget, I forget who the third, third guy was. But regardless, uh, you know, I had a few drinks in me. I'm hanging out with my friends. And then I have a buddy named Tanner Matthews. He's a, he's a close friend of mine, but he's, you know, he's a very talkative, uh, very uh, business kind of guy. And uh, he's your hype man. He's my, he's my hype man. Exactly. And you know, he's like, all right, man, I'm going to go introduce you, you know, like be the hype man. And uh, <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he kind of just like goes behind Sean and uh, just taps on his shoulder. And, you know, Sean like, turns around like super confused looking and, uh, Tanner introduces me and uh, it was cool because, you know, I just, again, I introduced myself and he's like, I, I know who you are. I watched your fight. And that was a cool moment. And uh, because like, yeah, I'm like, okay, this guy, I'm definitely on the radar. You know, this guy just told me he knows who, who I was. He watched my fight. And then I just kept it brief. And I just said, I, I hope I can fight for you one day. And he said, I hope so too. You know, and that, and that was kind of the end of that interaction. But then a few days later, I get the call, you know, I, I signed my contract for the contender series. And then actually the cool part about it was at the weigh-ins at the contender series, Sean Shelby saw me, obviously, again, he was the guy doing the weigh-ins. And then he kind of looked at me and he's like, ah, ah, see, got you in, got you in. And yeah. I was like, ah, oh, cool, man. Like you, you that, that was a very cool moment for you, me. Yeah. He remembered me, man. He remembered that interaction. And, uh, yeah, dude, like, honestly, I don't know if you've ever had that like secondhand embarrassment but when I, <laughs> when I went up to him, bro, I definitely felt that man, but it, it worked out really well. And uh, I'm very glad that, uh, yeah. I did what I did, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. Well, it worked out well for you, my man. Here you are. So, uh, you know, you did have your contender series fight. You won the fight. Uh, this is where, you know, I, I'm trying, whenever, also, once again, whenever you're sort of calculating and formulating an interview process, you, you want to make sure you talk about things that are interesting and you want to make sure that you're talking about things that aren't talked about a thousand times. So for the fa fans who are watching this right now who don't know, uh, there was a little bit of confusion at the end of your fight after, after you know, your victory over Ramon at Contender Series, but it was it was a dominant victory. You did great. But, you know, there's some people saying that, you know, maybe the stopped a little bit too soon, the referee made a mistake, whatever. So usually when your reporters talk to fighters like you, they, they ask the question, they pose it somehow like, you know, do you feel you have something to prove or, you know, do you need to finish this guy just to put a stamp on it just to make sure everybody knows? I'm willing to bet that's not even crossing your mind. Like, in your mind, to, to get to your level, to be such a winner and such a such a, a, a dominant fighter, you know already that you're the better fighter and you're going to beat him, right? Exactly, brother. You know, um, I was very confident if that fight went any any longer that it, it would have been over, you know? And I remember just telling myself in the back room, control the control controllables, you know? Mm -hmm. The ref pulled me off. I have no control over that at all. And uh, yeah, man, I... I 
I was the guy over top of him raining punches down. And uh, I knew I knew where he was at at that moment. And I was very, very confident that that fight was going to get stopped sooner or later. But, you know, I am excited. I do. I get that opportunity again. And uh, this time in front of my hometown, which which I think is it couldn't have Mm -hmm. been written any more perfectly. Yeah. Talk a little bit about how you went from being just the, the little scrawny kid that was showing up at the gym and wouldn't go away. And people are wondering like, why is this kid still here to being uh, on the eve of fighting in the world's preeminent mixed martial arts organization? Yeah. You know, um, I, when I grew up, when I was growing up, man, the two things, number one, I was always into extreme sports and like my parents always kind of like yelled at me for that. They're like, why can't you just play soccer? Cause I went from like BMX to skateboarding to snowboarding You know, like anything that like is extreme and gives me a crazy adrenaline rush, I was just obsessed with, man. So then when I found fighting, I'm like, wow, this, this is it. This is like as extreme as it gets, like just like high risk, you know, high reward and uh, so fun as well. And another thing is I've always wanted to be a performer. Like when I was a kid, I didn't know like what I wanted to perform at, but I always visualized myself performing in front of big audiences and like Honestly, I always say the story. I'm like, man, I wish I could just sing because then I could just be a singer, man, and perform in front of audiences. But I, you know, my, my, my talent was fighting and I, I, I naturally was really, really good at it. And I was like, wow, this is a great opportunity. Something that I love and something that I can perform. And that's why like these moments now where I get to do these things in front of these massive arenas, this is the biggest performance of a lifetime, man. And uh, it, it's crazy because I feel like some people it, it makes them nervous and kind of scared. Yeah. But for yeah. me, it only gives me energy, man, and excitement. But I truly think that's because I've always naturally been a performer and always wanted to perform in front of large crowds. There's just something about it, man, that makes me so excited and just like, I don't know if it's my ego talking, but I just love it. Well, despite what some people think, there's actually nothing wrong with having a healthy ego. It's just fine. I mean, it, it leads to a lot of success for some people. A hundred percent that you need a healthy balance, right? Because without an ego, you really, do you have any goals? You know, like you might not even be able to have goals without an ego. Uh, something you said a second ago, you know, you're right. Like some people, when you hear people get asked those questions about, you know, what's your worst nightmare? Surprisingly, a lot of people say it's doing something in front of a crowd, like talking or even just giving a speech or something like that. I'm willing to bet there's a correlation between you and, and being, you know, performance oriented and also taking risks. There's probably the two of them are tied together really closely. I'm willing to bet. Yeah. 100% man. Um, I, I just like, I notice like I just get in like deeper flow states, man, the more, the more pressure and the more, uh, eyes, eyes are on me. I don't, I don't know what it is, but like, you know, I've always been a big believer in like, uh, reading like sports psychology and, you know, my, and mindfulness books and, and things like that. So I think I just properly frame things into my brain and into my mind, man, where like, uh, I take advantage of these opportunities where, you know, some, some, some people, you know, they could be amazing performer performers at the gym, but then when it's fight night in front of like the bright lights, they just can't perform to their potential. Yep. I think I'm the opposite of that, man. Like I do perform well at the gym, but for some reason when it is fight night and it's, you know, high risk, high reward, everything is on the line. I feel like I, I'm like, that's where the magic happens. That's where these knockouts happen. And I I do things that I don't even understand how I do, to be honest. Like my body kind of just takes over, you know, I go in autopilot mode and uh, I just, I perform, I perform. It's just like art for me. Is there a sports psychology book that you'd recommend to people to read? Is there one favorite of yours or one that stands out? Yeah, so there's two that I I, I absolutely love and I, and I read over and over again. Um, number one is The Inner Game of Tennis and the second one is mm-hmm. The Mindful Athlete. They're both very, very good books and they're both books I've read multiple times throughout my career. Uh, I pick up the inner game of tennis every fight week and I, and I just go over it over and I skim through it. And, you know, I always get something else out of it every time I reread that book. You're at the point now where your competition is only going to get tougher as you're progress through your UFC career. You're going to fight tougher and tougher fighters and more skilled fighters. When you're reading these books, do you pre prepare for uh, adversity, like not even necessarily losing a fight, like what would happen if you lost a fight, but like, say if you're, you know, down two rounds, you know, are you ready for that? And do you know how you'll come out to, to face the third round to, to make sure you give yourself your best effort? Yeah. Funny you say that. So there's actually a chapter in the inner game of tennis that talks about, you know, big wave surfers and why like 
these surfers are always trying to find the biggest waves because when they find the biggest waves, that's when they challenge themselves the most. And that's where they can find, you know, the peak of their performance, right? And see how far they can really push themselves. So I think for me, it's really just about reframing that and being like the tougher my competition, the better, like I will have to perform the, the more, more of a higher self version of myself that I have to bring out. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful for my opponents and I'm grateful for that adversity that I'm, that I potentially might, might come for because without that adversity, I can't, I can't find out how far I can really, really push it. So with that mindset, man, like those things excite me rather than, you know, make me nervous or weigh me down. Yeah, that's cool. You know, and I don't think it's too woo for me to say that, uh, um, gratitude has come to the forefront in the past several years in a lot of people's minds. Like it used to be one of those things that you'd talk about and maybe it was on Oprah and, you know, just, just a, a whole bunch of certain types of people would be talking about gratitude, but now it's been more widespread where it's, you know, ac across the board, everybody talks about gratitude. And I think it's probably a, a good idea and it's probably beneficial to your life overall. 100%. Um, that's a, the, a gratitude practice is something that keeps developing in my life, man. Like to the point where like, I just recently got a cold plunge in my uh, in my house and I in a sauna, and I have a routine where when I sit in that cold plunge, man, I I, I go through a mantra, I, I go through a list of gratitude daily in the morning, at nighttime, and then in my journal as well. And anytime I'm having a tough day or maybe I had a tough practice and I'm just driving home, you know, I get in the car. And I start reframing those thoughts right away. I, I start listing the things I'm grateful for, man. I, I'm not injured today. I have tough training partners that push me to the to my max. You know, oh, my coach was hard on me. It was because he cares and he loves me. And I'm grateful that I have somebody that is willing to invest so much time in me, right? Mm -hmm. And it is. It, it, at the end of the day, it's just reframing, man. Because, you know, you can have 100 positive things happen during that day. And one negative thing. And your brain, for some reason, wants mm -hmm. to stick to that negative thing. Where it's like, man, like that's not the mentality we should be having. We should be grateful for all the positive in our lives. And man, I was when I was a young kid, man, I, my brain was completely backwards with that. Where I, I always fell into the negativity. And slowly over time, it's it's changed the other way, man. And it, it just it gets better and better every camp. And it makes me enjoy the process so much more. Like I'm not a miserable like little asshole in camp anymore. You know, I'm happy and I enjoy every single moment. What are you grateful for right now? I'm grateful for my health, man. I'm grateful for my health. I'm grateful for my family's health. I'm grateful that I get to do what I, I get to do every single day. I'm grateful for like my support and the community I have around me, man. All the people that care about me, all the coaches, uh, all my training partners. You know, I'm grateful for the opportunity to fight in the UFC in front of Toronto, in front of all my fans. The list goes on, man. Like it's amazing. I'm grateful for my bed. I'm grateful for my cold plunge. Like everything, man. Like I, I, it's unlimited, man. The more you really think about it, the and like the smaller the things are too. It's just like I'm grateful for it all, man. That's why I'm always I have a smile on my face all the time, man. Of course, you have hard <laughs> days, right? And sometimes it's a little bit of a burnout, but like, man, like the amount of positive and happy times I have during my day compared to the negative is, is completely different. That's fantastic. Do you find that attitude rubs off on the people around you or perhaps does their attitude influence you uh, in a positive way? That's a great question. Yeah. I think, uh, I think I try to lead by example, man. And, uh, you know, some people sometimes might be stuck in their ways, but I do notice, man, like, you know, when we come to the gym and, you know, there's a positive vibe to the energy and everybody's having a good time, it does rub off on people, man. And it mm -hmm. makes everybody, I love to see my training partners have a smile on their face after hard practice, you know, and, and my coaches and everybody. And, and uh, it almost like, you know, builds an aura of, of positive energy in front of the whole team, in front of the whole community. And uh, I think that's super important, man. And I, and I try to portray that as much as I can. And, you know, I have great people around me that are their very similar mindsets as me, man. So sometimes if I'm feeling a little bit down, I can take their energy and make myself feel a little bit better as well. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to your actual fight now at UFC 297. You're fighting a Ramon Tavares in a, in a rematch. Do you anticipate this being any different than the first go-around? Yeah, you know, I there there is no... Um, there is no way i can picture this fight coming man the way i guess the way the way i i do it bro is i i visualize a million different outcomes of the fight right i mm -hmm. but at the end of the day whatever he gives me is what i'm gonna take right that way i'm in, i'm in a flow 
instead of trying to force something, right? If I, I have this one outcome that I, I'm like, I need to KO him in the first round. I need to KO him in this first round and uh, it isn't happening, right? Like then there's like almost like a, a little bit of resistance between what I want and what is actually happening where I have a million different options in my head of how this fight's going to go and a bunch of different ways and whatever he gives me, I'm going to take, you know? Uh, I am a finisher at heart. You know, a lot of my fights have been finishes, but I think it's mostly because I'm not trying to force anything. I just take what, what, what is. Yeah, for sure. Did, when you fought him the first time, was he what you expected? Yes. Yeah. He, what he was, you know, um, he, w one thing I do is, and I think it is a good thing is for some reason I build up my opponents to like be like absolute world beaters and i think it's because i watch them you know through the lens of youtube or through fight fight passes and stuff and um i, w I watch it there and, and i see see them dealing with other fighters who are not me right and i see you know you're watching it and when it's from like a third person they're like wow he's he hits so hard wow he's so fast wow his 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 technique and his everything is so flawless but when i get in there and it's first person i really really quickly i realize oh wow like you know, I, I can see that I can see his punches. I can take his punches. I can uh, deal with his speed and it becomes much more comfortable. Like every time I get in that cage, I start moving. I realize right away. Wow. Like I am definitely ready for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, I did expect those fa fast hands, you know, that he is a very like skilled boxer and he has great yeah. hands. But, uh, you know, nothing phased me in that last fight. Uh, I know it was a short fight, but I was I was very confident and I was smiling at him before that KO because uh I knew I had his timing on his speed down. Mm -hmm. Have you attended a UFC before? Yes, I have. I've been to uh, one, two. I've been to three UFC events: UFC Ottawa, UFC Toronto, UFC Vancouver. Nice. You know, it's always cool when you go there. Like people, some people will go there for the first time. They might think they know what they're going to expect, but it's when that music comes on, they start playing the Who and just the atmosphere. It's just absolutely nuts. I wonder what's going to be like for you. Like, I, you know, clearly I'm not a professional fighter, but sometimes I imagine what it must feel like for people in your situation. You know, you know what to expect, but this time you're not going out as a fan. You're not, not going out as a corner. You're not going as a teammate. You are going out as the person who's going to be under the floodlights, through the crowd, to your music playing super loud. That's got to be an amazing prospect. Yeah, my goal for this, buddy, is just to really enjoy every single second and soak up every single second of, of this experience. Not only fight night, but fight week, weigh-ins, you know, the whole process of being there and just really enjoy it, man, because, you know, I treat myself like I'm live I'm like a main character of a movie or a player one of a video game. And that's kind of how I try to like look through it, man. And, uh, you know, if all these other uh, individuals have been able to do in the past like why why can't i do it right and, and i treat it yeah. like that and i treat it like i'm just watching myself in like a movie that is ri being written by me man and uh I i'm just like the director and the, and the main character and like when, when i have that perspective you know i can really really sit back and just enjoy it because like at the end at the end of my career man i can look back and really enjoy those moments and be really proud of the the hard work and and mm -hmm. the moments i've had Who's going to be in your corner with you? So in my corner, I'm going to have Lyndon Willock and Paul Zorbert. They're, 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 you know, they've been in my corner for the last, yeah. like, like I don't even know how long. But another cool thing is I'm going to have my third corner man, Gavin Hessen. And he's a, he's a really high-level fighter. He was actually Lyndon Willock's first coach. So this guy's a pioneer in the fight game, man. Like, high, high-level black belt with amazing boxing and he's uh he was actually the first person who ever believed in me man and whoever saw something in me way before i ever saw something in myself I, I must have been 16 years old 16 years old at burlington training center it was called tap out at the time and i just again scrawny little kid and i just shut my mouth and i just showed up to practice and i worked hard and one day he just approached me and you know asked to train me and I was so nervous because I was like, damn, this Jack tattooed guy, you know, who's like killing it. Like he just wants to like, like train me. I'm like, OK, I, I don't see, I don't see why you want to. But of, of course. And, uh, you know, it's a crazy journey because I remember us talking about like maybe one day we'll get into the UFC. And now he's going to be walking me out. And uh, that's I'm so excited to share that moment with him, man. That's almost kind of the running joke amongst your circles is that some of the guys like Josh Hill and others just talk about how, you know, in, in their mind, you're the kid. You're just like the little scrawny guy. 
And now look at yeah, but now. it's been a decade. It's been a decade, man. I know, it's, I know, I know. When I look back <laughs> at it, I realize, oh shit! When Josh was killing, like you know, when Josh was like starting his professional career on the Score Fighting Series, and Lyndon Willock was in the middle of his pro career and stuff, they were my age. They were my age, right? Yeah. And now it's like, and I was a sixteen-year-old, and now it's like a decade later, later, but nothing's changed. Josh still looks the same. So it's yeah, like, I know. It, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it feels, it feels, it feels trippy, right? But uh. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I still feel like the kid, man. I still do, you know. I, I, I honestly still do. But it's crazy that, uh, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're all doing this together and it's been a decade since since we started this crazy journey. That's awesome. Well, Serhi, uh, you know, I, I've known you for a while now. We're not best friends. I don't know you all that well. Just you know you sort of incidentally from the gym. But you've always been a really, uh, like you said in this interview, a very positive attitude, very friendly, very outgoing, even when you're training. Uh, I'm really happy and thrilled for you. I'm excited for you because, you know, a lot of times I interview UFC fighters and they're talking about their fights and, you know, I, I talk to them for one fight and their next fight and their next fight, but there's only one first fight in the UFC and this is yours right now. So I'm excited for you, man. Congratulations. Thank you so much, brother. I really appreciate you taking the time. Okay. Before we get going, do you have anybody like to thank any sponsors, any, anything like that? Yeah, I would love to give a shout out to my sponsors. Um, Simply CBD Canada. That's been a huge sponsor for me. Uh, Phenom Doc, Joe App Support, uh, Forged Iris Stout, uh, Conor McGregor's Beer Company. They just sponsored me, which is amazing. Uh, GoFlow Studios, 50 Pesos Fresh, as well as Herx, uh, Herx Nutrition Burlington. And uh, yeah, those those are it right there. Awesome. Thanks, sir. He. Well, I won't be able to be there. I'm in, uh, currently in England right now, and I'm, I, I wish I oh, could cool. be there. But, uh, you know, hopefully I'll get to see your next UFC fight. So all the best from MMA and everyone in Canada. Good luck, and uh, I guess we'll see you on the pay-per-view. Thank you, brother. All right, sorry. Take care.